People just see the, the finished product. They don't see all the time and all the effort that goes into it. And so by the time you see the product on the field, that's the finished product. But yeah, we're putting in 40 plus hours in on the opponent that we're playing and it's laser like focus. Cause I was cut three times um, before I even made the NFL. I was cut three times and I went to Europe. I played in Canada. But so I just had a mental fortitude, you know, growing up in the Chicago projects, like I know what it's like to be down. I know what it's like to be kicked when you're down and I know how to get up and I know how to fight through and, and to break through and eventually, you know, shine. What would be your first few moves when somebody starts getting some money? Honestly, I think you should probably get a life insurance policy, something safe, something secure. In the event that you're not here anymore, your family's going to be taken care of. For, for a young player, the sooner you get life insurance. And then that's one thing you don't, you know, like you mentioned from the hood, it's something we're not exposed to, yep. that that's the way that families continually pass on wealth. Boom! And I made more money in fitness, my first five years in fitness, than I made my entire life in football. What? With the grades, they just, they, they just put so much more time and effort. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Gita. So my guest today comes from a very special heart, place in our heart from the Chicago Bears. Um, special team standout here, pro bowler, three years in a row, Super Bowl champ with the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, what can I say? Advocate for gay rights. Yet he's not gay, but he's staying up for injustice. Folks, I have with us today Brian Ayen Badejo of Nigerian descent, but all American here in the United States of America. Brandon, welcome to the conversation both here in Seven Figure Squad. What up, baby? How's it going today, man? <laughs> Good, man. Thanks for making time for us. I'm, uh, I'm excited about this conversation because uh, what's pretty cool about your story, well, a lot of people don't know, your older brother, I know you call, you call him Femi, right? Yep. You call your older brother. What's pretty cool about that is uh, both of y'all won your Super Bowl rings with the Baltimore Ravens, but just different years. Yeah, that, the first or actually, this only the second set of brothers to do that to win on the same team, but in a different genre. Right. So he he won it in what two thousand, and you won it in two thousand thirteen. Yeah, twenty twelve. He won it in two thousand. I won it with the twenty twelve team. <sighs> Amazing man. Amazing, and uh, three different teams. That, we used it three different teams. You guys were professional athletes on. Was it uh, was it the uh, it was the Miami Dolphins? Obviously the Bears. Was, am I missing another team? I played with the Ravens, Bears, and Dolphins. He played in Minnesota. He played in Baltimore. He played in Arizona, and then he did one year in Miami. But between the two of us, we did like 22 years in the league or something. We played in three Super Bowls, three Pro Bowls. We can add you in the mix, too. Between you, me, and my brother, we got two Super Bowl rings. <laughs> <laughs> bro, bro, listen, everybody talks about the quarterbacks, the Manning brothers, and all these. How come the story hasn't been about the Ayambadejo brothers, man? Come on, media. You got to celebrate this story. There's, so, I mean, there's so many brothers in the league, you know? I mean, like, it's rare for one guy to get in there, but to have, like, there's, there's, there's a set of three brothers in the league right now. Um, but there's always, there's always, you know, there's always like 10 sets of brothers that play in the league. There's 2,500 guys in the NFL at any given time. And there's always going to be like 10 sets of brothers that play, which is pretty special. And it's hard to yeah. do it. But you think about it with the DNA, you have a better chance of the, with the DNA in your own house yeah. than you do with, you know, somebody else. So it's pretty cool. But like you said earlier, the special thing about you being brothers, you guys won your, won your rings. You got, you got Super Bowl champions. I mean, what's, what's that, uh. What's the conversation like over dinner, over over Thanksgiving, over when you guys get together? I mean, for for the longest time, it was like he was trying to push me, like, man, you guys got to win this ring, you guys got to win this ring. So every year I'd get into the playoffs, he'd give me his Super Bowl ring, you know, and I'd wear his ring during the playoff runs. I played of my ten years, I played in seven rounds of playoffs, you know. Um, so uh, every year, he, you know, he's he's always been selfless. You know how it is, you know, an, yeah. an older sibling always wants their y younger siblings to do better than them. He's always been selfless and always pushed me yeah. to, to achieve more than he ever did. So and he, he was successful in that. That's awesome. Well, the way we got connected because of my uh, videos up on, on my seven physical squad channel about life insurance, uh, you're, you're a big believer in life insurance, uh, but I want to get to that in a second. I, I want to express a jock in me real quick because, because <laughs> I'm just a one big frustrated jock. But uh, I, I remember the day we uh, we heard about you because the, the the Bears traded for you. You were with the Miami Dolphins, and they're bringing in this special player from the Miami Dolphins to do special teams in in um, in, in the Chicago Bears. And 
in my opinion, for lack of a better term, I didn't know you. You know, you were a gunner. You were just going. You're just going right for the ball, right? And and every time the with a kick return or a punt return, you're always down there, man. You're you're you want making the tackle. Um, and at the same time, well, a lot of people don't realize if you're watching this, he was blocking for the great Devin Hester, right? An NFL record breaking uh, returner in the kicking game, which sadly the kicking game has been greatly modified. But uh, uh, Brent, what was your experience like here in the Chicago Bears? I know you were, we were you were born here, right? You were born here for a minute, and and uh, you lived here for a minute, and then you guys took off to Nigeria. You guys came back. What was your experience like here in Chicago? Man, I mean, Chicago is my home away from home. You know what I'm saying? Like I grew up right down the way from uh, Wrigley Wrigley Park, so we go to Wrigley. Um, we go to White Sox game too, but we're more like Cubs fan. We go wherever we got free tickets. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Hamlin Park on Diver- Diversity and Clybourne. Um, and, North side. Uh, I grew there we up go. in the Lathrop Homes, Lathrop Homes housing projects. Wow. Um, and but just to be able, to, you know, and and then in my era when I was growing up, it's like, you know, of course there was MJ, but um, sweetness, Walter Payton, was of course, everything. of course, and the punky QB. So like, I grew up with that '85 Bears team and Ron Rivera and all those special players, the Fridge and um, Dent and Galt and all those guys. But um, so for me to be able to come back to Chicago, the city I was born in, the city I was raised in, the city that I learned. You yeah. know, almost everything, you know, yeah. as much as a 10 year old can learn. Yeah. But um, to come back and play for the Bears, like it was a dream come true. So yeah. every day that I put on that that helmet, it, it represented my city and it rep- represented a part of my heart and soul. I I, I gave everything to that organization. Um, sure did. So it was a very special team to play for. And a player like me, like they gave me a ton of opportunity and I could just go out there and do my thing. Um and yeah, I mean, we went out there, we played special teams. It was all important. Like special teams was just, it was better than the offense. <laughs> what happened in that Arizona Cardinals game where we oh. all our points on defense and special teams. So it was better than the offense cert- at certain junctures in time. Yeah. But um, it was just every, you know, it was, it, I, I felt my best when I was playing in Chicago. People say, oh, what was your favorite city to play in? Well, I'm biased. Like I'm from Chicago. So playing in Chicago, going to Gibson's the night before the game and then, um, going to get in that Chicago mix popcorn after the game, like, <laughs> that was everything. That was everything to me for sure. Man, you played. You played. Uh, you played. Um, obviously, in the, the defensive locker room with the linebacker. You played with Locker with, with Lock. You played with uh, um, uh, Briggs. Uh, uh, um, uh, Tommy 90- Wale, Izzy, yeah. Peanut, Greeny, Brownie. Like we had some ballers. Tank. Oh, that was the team was right there, ballers. man. Basher. Man, oh, we had some balls. Three one, yeah. Yeah, Jerry yeah. Azuma, like, come on. Zoom twenty three, Zoom before uh, Hester took over his number. Yeah, yeah, man, that's that's crazy. Cause Zoom's still out here in Chicago. Um, when 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 you're thinking about game preppers, let, let's talk about game prep because uh, you know we have, we have a brand here called Entrepathlete. You know, entrepreneur athlete put together. You know, as, as a pro athlete, you know, uh, uh, um, how much studying, how much game prep? I mean, your special teams. What are you what are you looking at on, on film? What, what what's what's your preparation like? Yeah, I mean the preparation. People just see the game on Sunday. Yeah, they realize they don't realize all the prep that goes into it. So Tuesday, Monday, and Tuesday are body days, and then Monday is the day where you kind of look over mistakes and things that you did well, and and you kind of put that game to bed on Monday. On Tuesday, it's just an all body and prep day, and then on Wednesday you get back to practice and you start you know. Um, mentally and physically getting ready for your next opponent. And then we'll practice Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday is a walkthrough, but we're putting in, in the classroom, we're putting five hours in on the classroom, probably two hours in on the field, and then another two hours in for your body prep, physical therapy, um, conditioning, training, so on and so forth. So people just see the, the finished product. They don't see all the time and all the effort that goes into it. And so by the time you see the product on the field, that's the finished product. But yeah, we're putting in, 40 plus hours in on the opponent that we're playing and it's laser like focus. I mean, there's, you're talking about, you know, the team is a, you know, the bears is probably a three to $4 billion franchise and, you know, the players make the franchise what it is. And of course with the fan support, but um, it's like, there's no time to to have anybody that's not a hundred percent focused on winning a championship at all times. Even if your record's terrible, trust me, the guys are in there trying to win a championship and it's laser like focus um, uh, on Wednesday all the way through to Sunday when you play the game. Well, everybody's talking about preparation. Let's look at Tom Brady right now because what a lot of people don't remember lately is that you actually intercepted Tom Brady when you were at Miami, right? And and, the, and your team went to uh, Miami went to go win on by, like, by a point. Um, 
So you intercepted Tom Brady, man. Uh, career interception. <laughs> first career interception with Tom Brady. What, what's it like playing with these greats? What's the common denominator? I mean, there's players and then there's greats. You, you play with Erlocker. You, you, you play with Ray Lewis. You play with these... Junior Seau. Junior Seau. Oh, pfft. Jason Taylor. Like, yeah, I played with some of the greatest linebackers to ever play the game. Terrell Suggs, Haloti Nada, um, even though he's not a linebacker, uh, Ed Reed. Um, I played with some greats. I think with the greats, they just they, they just put so much more time and effort. You know, like I, I think I'm one of the greatest special teams players at all of all time. You know, but um, I didn't play that much defense. But I put most of my focus, my time and effort. You know, on the football field. You know, probably seventy percent was on special teams, and then thirty percent was in on the defense. But um, these guys just go above and beyond. Like Tom Brady just loves to watch film all day, every day. You know. Whereas for me, like on a Tuesday, like I'm focusing on my body. I'm taking the day off. I'm going to do some community service. Tom Brady probably does all that, but then he probably puts some film on as well, you know? So yeah. um, I, I think, you know, for what I was doing, I mastered my craft. There wasn't much more for me to do as a special teams player. But, you know, had I played defense, then you're talking about, you know, a magnitude of order of how much more time and effort I, I would have had to put into the game. And I didn't always have those opportunities when I did. I did it. But, um, yeah, that's the difference between Tom Brady, uh, Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, um, Brian Erlacher. Those guys just put in a, a ton of effort. Zach Thomas, Jason Taylor, they put so much time and effort into their craft. It was, it was, it was amazing. So, Brandy, you, you, uh, you're you going to make me want to go buy your, your trading card right now, man. Best, best special teams player stand. I'm going to make sure it's PSA 10. I need PSA 10, uh, Brandon. Before I get it graded, I need, I need your autograph, by the way, man. <laughs> But Brett, Whatever you need, I got you. Man. My man, big dog. Uh, when, you, when you're looking at the, the players in, in terms of prep, you're looking at these guys. What, what was – because there's, there's guys in the league for one or two years and out. NFL stands for not for long. What separated the guys that were not for long versus guys like you that played double-digit years in the league? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, there's so many different things that would separate us, you know, but I think – you know, one thing is you have to look at the talent, you know, were, were they living off of talent in college and they weren't, you know, executing and, and living up to their potential? How did they take care of their bodies? How serious were they in the locker room? What were they doing off the field? There's so many different things you could you could look at and, and attribute like, you know, why were you successful? Or why weren't you successful? I think, you know, the main thing for me is I never really had any injuries or any issues with my body. I always took care of my body. I've always been a gym guy. I've always been a supplement guy, my sleep, my diet. I've always been great with that. And um, guys tend to think, you know, when you're younger, you think you're immortal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. You think you could just sh show up and, and you're going to be the best you can be. But we know that that's not true. So I've always, I was always great and I was always blessed in that area that my body was always going to be able to accomplish anything I set my mind to. And um, I was pretty much injury free for the most part. So you start with the injuries and then what's going on with the injuries and what else is going on off the field. It's a lot to handle those first yep. couple of years. But if you make it through the first contract, then your chances of playing longer are greater. If you can't make it through the first contract, then it's pretty much, you know, going to be a wrap. But um, yep. for me, it took me three contracts to even get my first one because I was cut three times um, before I even made the NFL. I was cut three times and I went to Europe. I played in Canada. But so I just had a mental fortitude, you know, growing up in the Chicago projects, like I know what it's like to be down. I know what it's like to be kicked when you're down. So um, I, and I know how to get up and I know how to fight through and, and to break through and eventually, you know, shine. And that's ultimately what I did. But I just think it's, you know, I'm just a dog and an underdog and I'm just a grinder, much like you are. I know what type of lifestyle I wanted to live. I know what type of person I wanted to be. I, I wanted to know the, the things I wanted to achieve and accomplish in life. And I wasn't going to stop until I did those things. So, so what, what birthed that into you? I mean, what, what were you seeing? Was it this something that you that you saw in high school or was it in in, in junior high, because I'm, I'm hearing habits. The, the, the whole theme you've been talking about, your body, the way you approach the gym, the way you approach the game, the way you approach study, on field, off field. All, all I'm hearing is habits, 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 habits. What, 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 when were you inspired? Was it, was it early in your career or was it later, later on in Man, your honestly, like as a little kid, like I wanted to, like if anybody, you know, I, I wasn't like a bully or anything, but I remember when I was five or six years old and I'd be in um, the Latham Homes projects and I'd be just cruising through the projects and kids would be wrestling and I'd go jump in there and they'd be 10 year old kids and I'd be six and I want to wrestle them. 
and um or you know my, me and my brother would you know try to play basketball against some of the older kids or i was always just very competitive you know yeah and i always wanted to win yeah um and i was never scared of anything so i was pretty much a fearless kid so i think you know a combination of of wanting to you know iron sharpens iron not being scared of anything taking chances and um just being brave i think uh it it, it took me a long way and i didn't have much else you know like yeah. what else do you have all I had was heart and hustle. That's it. I, you know, had some couple food stamps in my pocket. <laughs> uh, I had maybe had a bike with a flat tire. Didn't have much food at home. So that breeds, you know, like you want to live a different lifestyle as you as you get older. And and I was never shy of uh, hard work. And that's ultimately, you know, how I achieved everything. It's just through hard work. And I see all that same stuff in you, which is why, you know, when I saw you online, I was like, man, this guy's my kind of guy right here. Uh, this guy, my man, big dog. When when, when you're looking at um, you know, because, you know, the late, great Kobe Bryant, it was a one-year anniversary of his death a few days ago. Right. And one of his biggest things was film study. One of his biggest things is like, for example, Allen Iverson said, hey, dog, I'm, um, after the game, I'm going to the club. But Kobe says, I'm going to the gym. Right? So th- that's the difference of, of, of habits. So if, if, a, if a young player is watching this right now on our channel, they're, they're coming up in – in high school, they're coming up in college. What would you What would you tell them if you want to make it to the show? If you want to make you want to make it to the league, what habits do you have to incorporate right now? Yeah, I man, I think you got to look at look at everything that you're doing, and you know what what is serving you and what's not serving you. If something's serving you, then keep it keep it in that circle of the pie of things that are making you better, that are making you great. And then how can you add to that? And then from that pie, you want to take out the things that aren't serving you. So, you know, are you playing a lot of video games? Are you hanging out with the homies too much and going to parties or whatnot? Like, of course, you want a healthy balance of, of life and work and, and healthy and healthy uh, mental habits as well. So you want to have some unwinding time. Of course, you want to be around people that you enjoy. But you ultimately want to be doing things that are serving you and things that you enjoy, whether, you know, it, it, it's something that's bringing you joy or it's something that's making you better. Or it's serving you in some way. And the younger you are, more things you think serve you, you know, like. I used to play with GI Joes and I love that. But of course, as a kid, that's just fine. But, you know, eventually as I got older, I trained out the GI Joes for barbells and dumbbells and, <laughs> and you know, the track and running and the weight room. So um, as you get older, you know, it's like, you know, your your vision needs to narrow and then it needs to focus in on what it is you're, that you're trying to achieve. And then, of course, setting some goals, you know, like for me out of high school, I didn't get a scholarship. I had to go to junior college and from junior college. I went to UCLA out of UCLA. I didn't get drafted and I was unrestricted free agent. And then I got signed, cut, blah, blah, blah. But I had, you know, my seven-year goals, my five-year goals, my three-year goals, my one-year goals. Of course, those kind of shift. But um, ultimately, I had goals and I knew that I wasn't going to get a scholarship out of high school. So even in high school, I had a plan. I'm going to go to JUCO for two years. I'm going to play for one year. I'm going to graduate from JUCO. Then I can go to any school I want to, um, regardless of academics. Like my my academics are going to be so good that I can get in academically if I wanted to go to Harvard or if I wanted to go to a school that required great grades like a Stanford or a UCLA. Um, so, you know, I, I had these goals set. And, you know, from my my senior year, that was a three-year goal was to get into a D1 school at some point in time, be a scholarship because our family didn't have any money. So, you know, from there, play at UCLA and then eventually get to the league. And I didn't plan on going to Canada and taking the, the route less traveled, but those yeah. are the things that I had to do to ultimately achieve and accomplish. But so goal setting what serves you and eliminating the things that don't serve you and just focusing in on, on what's important. When, when you're thinking about, um, you know, make it into the league, you, you get in the league now, you know, they have that rookie symposium, right? And we're going to educate you. Let's, let's, let's dial this when it comes to finances. You start to make a little bit of money now. You know, you got, you got even more attractive. You got the ladies. You got, you got the clubs. You got all these things going on. How how would you start how would you start handling your finances? What what would you be your what would be your first few moves when somebody starts getting some money? Yeah, so it's like you you got to think about it. But like for me, I have such a good team around me, and I built this team in the last maybe in the last over the last ten years. I built this team. I've been out of the league for eight years, so even a long ways into my time in the league, I didn't have this team and this education around me. And the more money you have the better resources and the better people you have around you, but also a lot of things pulling from you. But oddly enough, I think probably the most important thing is because nothing's guaranteed, right? So you sign this deal, you go to the NFL, you're 22 years old, and say you have a $5 million contract of which 2 million is guaranteed, but you're going to make the next 3 million over the next four years. Like, 
what should you do? Honestly, I think you should probably get a life insurance policy, something safe, something secure. In the event that you're not here anymore, your family's going to be taken care of. Like, it, I didn't have kids till I was 27, so it's kind of hard to see that vision. But the great thing about the life insurance policy is the younger you are, the cheaper it is, right? Yep. So um, the younger you get a nice life insurance policy, and then you're you know putting that money into that life insurance policy, and it's building up its cash value, um, and then you can leverage that at some point, I think that's probably the safest, best way to start things out. By the way, enough, full, right? full, full disclosure, Brendan's not my client. He's not, he's not my client. Uh, he's not one of the clients or agents. He's just doing this from wisdom. He's learned from his, his time in, in the league and dealing with finances. What, what exposed your reality? Because oftentimes, especially coming from the hood, people think that life insurance is just for when you die. When were you exposed to the money making, the living benefits of life insurance? When were you exposed to that education? Yeah, so I mean, I got my first, you know, we have um, my first whole life policy. I didn't get till I was probably 27 when I had a child. But um, that's around the time I was exposed to it because I'm like, all right, you know, what am I going to do, you know, in the event that something happens to me? And then you have, you know, kind of like that annual policy um, that the NFL gets for you. Yeah. And, you know, in the event that something happens, but, you know, they're, they're renewing that every single year. So that's a little bit different. So it took me a little while. It took me until I was 27 to learn about, you know, the benefits of, uh, of using your life insurance and accruing that cash value. And now, like, I use it all the time. You know wow. what I'm saying? Like, I started my business. I have 50 Orange Theory Fitness uh, franchises wow. um, across the United States and in Melbourne, Australia. I took the money to put my down payment on my first Orange Theory. I took it out of my life insurance policy, and I used that money. So um, really, you know, at 27 is when I started buying into that. And then from there, I got every one of my kids a policy. Now, I have several policies. My wife has a policy. So between my whole family, like, we have eight policies, um, whole life insurance policies in this house. It's something I firmly believe in, but it's also given me the foundation, the confidence, the balance in the way that I balance my portfolio. But for, for a young player, the sooner you get life insurance. And then that's one thing you don't, you know, like you mentioned from the hood, it's something we're not exposed to, yep. that that's the way that families continually pass on wealth. Boom. Um, it's through life insurance Hello. And, and generational wealth, you know? So yep. my kids are going to be good. Like, I don't need to leave them a cent. If I die, like, I can spend all my money right now and if I die tomorrow, and I want to live a good life too, and that's what I love about you is that you, you're smart with your money, but you want to live a good life as well. <laughs> you have a certain type of lifestyle that you want to live. And like, I'm not trying to save every single nickel, every every single penny that I have. And why don't I have to do that? Because the second something happens to me, my life insurance kicks in and there'll yeah. be pen, plenty of tax-free money, you know, that's being handed down to my kids. So you were in the league for a minute. You were making professional income. You have an agent behind you. How did you find your agent? I mean, how did you find your life, not your sports agent, but how did you get exposed to a, a life insurance agent to start explaining this stuff to you? Yeah, so, you know, I was lucky just because through my through my financial advisor, he's got a, a life insurance company built into it. Good. And um, it just worked that way. And then from there, we kind of started adding pieces and, and changing my portfolio. And I could do different things based on what my life insurance was doing. Yeah, gotcha. So I didn't want to hold, you know, a lot of financial advisors are really conservative with the way that they're investing in the world is changing right now. So, you know, as the world started changing and as, as my risk profile started changing, I'm like, well, I have this life insurance that's guaranteed and I have bonds that are backing it and so on and so forth. Like, I don't need to keep investing my money in bonds. Um, I can put my money in riskier things and yep. I can let my life insurance be my very conservative yep. part of my portfolio you save money. And, it, and it's acting in the way that it needs to act. So this has grown and this has changed. You know, initially, as I started learning about the life insurance, um, we had a more conservative portfolio and I knew I had, you know, income coming in through the NFL. So that kind of changed our strategy. But as, as I got older and things changed and then I started coming into a lot more money then it's like for a minute I outgrew my life insurance. So <laughs> I'm like, I have these life insurance policies. I don't need them, you know. Yeah. Um, of course, there's going to be a great, you know, tax-free benefit to whoever's here after me, but I don't need them. Then we had to restructure and re-strategize, and then I started learning about premium um, life and premium funded and premium finance life right. insurance, which is a whole different monster yeah. that I've been exposed to in the last year, which I love, and, and they're super exciting. And it made, you know, life insurance, it refreshed it for me and it made it sexy again. But um, yeah, it's always, a, there's always new products that come online as well. So um, I, I think it's it's always a learning um, yep. 
opportunity for me to learn about life insurance and all the amazing things that it can do. And also something as of late we're looking into is, is as you come into liquidity events, as you come into, you know, opportunities where you're making a lot of money, um, you can buy policies in advance that can save you and shelter your taxes. When you get these, you know, huge liquidity events, you can buy policies that will make it so they mitigate your tax liability on the front end. So we're doing some of that stuff. I mean, there's so many cool things that you can do with life insurance and it, it's fun to talk about, but you don't really see, you don't have, it's hard to have access to people that have knowledge yeah. um, and use the, the, the insurance policies the right way. No, I think the only exposure to a lot of athletes was when Jim Harbaugh became a coach at Michigan and he asked that, I think it was like five or $10 million be right. reallocated to his life insurance policy. Right. It was what they call a split That's dollar right. ar arrangement. So if I stay here, a portion of my salary, even though you tax me on that income, is going to go to my life insurance policy because I want that growing. And now he's, he's got a new contract with Michigan. So it's, it's interesting how when you, when you break down what the wealthy do, sure, they maximize their 401k, but there's only a certain amount of money you can put inside the 401k. But you know, six figures, some guys even seven figures, are going into a life insurance contract. And so that's where the, 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 the misconception of it's only for when you die or a certain, a certain amount of money. So yeah, you're a financial advisor. So I'm just curious, this is the, this is the help out our community because sometimes our, 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 our financial professionals don't know how to access clientele like yourself. So how did you find your financial advisor? So I had a friend um, that was playing in Tampa at the time. Gotcha. And he was his financial advisor. And then I just took a meeting and I met with several advisors. And, you know, it's like dating, you know what I'm saying? So I went yeah. and I dated one, <laughs> I went and dated another. And, you know, eventually I found one, you know, that worked for me. And um, it, it's kind of funny because I was talking to him last night. And uh, I'm not going to say his name, but he just did. He had to get out of, um, out of all the the uh, financial advising because his business took off that he was doing on the side and he just did a $70 million deal um, through cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and whatnot. And so we were just, you know, shooting it up last night talking about crypto and he sends me this little, um, this little screenshot of, of his uh, bank, one of his bank accounts at $70 million in cryptocurrency. That's so it. cool. I'm like, damn dog, you're balling. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but it's funny that he was my advisor and, you know, he's still, you know, as a fiduciary for me. Correct. But I, I think the tough thing is to have that circle of people that you trust yep. and that they're in it for you. They're not in it to make money. You know yep. what I'm saying? That's why I love that you take your whole team with you and I see your team around you and you're trying to educate people and be like, hey, if you want to live a certain life, lifestyle, yeah. these are the things you have to do. And millionaires run with millionaires and billionaires run with billionaires and broke people run with broke people. So it's like, who's in your circle? Who's around you? And I've been, man, I've been so lucky, like coming from the projects of Chicago, a single mom with three kids to be living where I'm living. Like I live in, you know, I live in Brentwood, Los Angeles right now. Like Kobe lives, not Kobe, Kobe used to live in this neighborhood when mm. he was uh, with his first contract with the Lakers. But like LeBron lives down the street and uh, Draymond lives down the hill. Like it's, it's a great neighborhood. Kamala Harris lives in the neighborhood too, talking about, you know, vice president. But um, nice. I'm just, I've been so blessed and, and, and fortunate um, to come from my humble beginnings and background and to be in the position that I am now. And I just want to be able to continue to lock that in. Yeah. It, we're always honing, we're always refining. And then um, to be able to pass that on my on to my kids and then my kids carry on the legacy as well. That's so awesome, man. So it's word of mouth. You didn't answer a direct mail piece in the mail. <laughs> Even though there's a list with the, uh, with the NFLPA, you could be an advisor on the, uh, the list. You can be part of the, uh, you know, part of the approved list that, that goes to the background check, pays $5,000 a year, be part of the financial advisory list, a real estate list, an insurance right. list. But it, for you, for you, it's still word of mouth. You, 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 you found word of mouth. Yeah. Okay, people that you trust. Uh, you, talk about, you talk about building this team, Brandon. Let me ask you this question. What's some of the check marks, what's some of the, the filters that you mentally go through to say this person deserves to be on my team? Is it, is it, is it influence? Is it uh, trustwor trustworthiness? Is it character? What's some of the markers you go through? Yeah, like I think there, there's certain things that are unknown, but you have to spend a certain amount of time with people, you yeah. know? Okay. People can fool you. People can trick you. I've been fooled. I've been tricked. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you have to spend a certain amount of time with people, but you have to like look inside yourself first. Like, okay, what is it that I need? What am I proficient at? You know, what are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? Where do I need help? You know, yeah. and, and for me, as I, be, as I started, you know, escalating through kind of that financial ladder and getting to a certain type of net worth, 
um, then different people were coming towards me and I knew at certain times I needed those people and at certain times I like I wasn't ready for those people yet. So, you know, as I started to educate myself, my standards got higher. What I needed was more more complex and more complicated. Like I have a tax attorney now, you know, yeah. I have a venture capital group that I belong to that, that takes me along and they teach me different things about investing and we'll go see different companies and so on and so forth. I have my tax advisor. I have my insurance guy that does kind of everything but life insurance. Then I have my guy that does my life insurance, which is different. You know, my other guy does like my house, uh, cars, balloons and, and things like that. So um, I, over the years, I built this team around me based off of what I needed and where I was lacking and having these people fill in the gaps. And um, it, it, it takes time because, you know, I'm always trying to evolve and change. I'm not trying to stay the same. And those people may come in or come out of your life. So yeah. I think the most important thing is I, I built my team and the team, even though they're not all on the same team, they're all on my team and they all work with each other and they all kind of check and balance each other. So if I do a phone call for, you know, this huge life insurance policy that I'm working on, my tax attorney's on it, my accountant's on it, and then my fiduciary's on it, and then my insurance policy guy's on it, and then I'm on it. So we have five people on the phone call making sure that everything checks all the squares, all the boxes. And there's questions that I might not know that my financial advisor asks. Yeah. There's different, you know, things that might kick in on how we need to structure this thing that my accountant will ask. So I get everybody in the room and it's a Zoom call. And, yeah, yeah. You know, we hash all these things out and we figure out like, hey, what's for Brendan? Everybody's on there um, on that phone call to do what's best for me. And you have, just have to have those people in your life that they're trying to do it for you. And I think I've been lucky that all my people they, they they love their jobs and they do their job because they want to help people, not because they want to make money. You know what I'm yeah, saying? For sure. Like, why do you have your whole team? Why are you building this whole thing out with education and people and all the different things that you're doing? Like, you could do this by yourself and you could get rich by yourself if you wanted to, but you're trying to take the whole tribe along with you. So um, that's what I love about my team is that like they understand like, hey, what's best for Brendan and, you know, yeah, I might make some money if, if Brendan does certain things, but that's not why they're there. They're ultimately there to help people. That's awesome. It takes time to get to know people. Um, let's talk about your, your, your transition from playing professional sports into your life after football, uh, because you got the rest of your life to live now. You know, uh, what, why did you choose entrepreneurship? What, you know, what, what made sense to you about Orange Theory? Uh, was it something because obviously you, you take care of your body, you take care of your health, you're a workout guy. Was that just something you naturally just fell into? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in, um, in 2009, I blew out my knee. Um, I was playing on defense, starting on defense. I was playing special teams. I was just playing a little bit too much, and I blew out my knee. And um, earlier that summer, a friend had approached me like and said, hey, Brendan, you ever think about going back to school and getting your master's in business? And I was like, yeah, you know, it's something I would think about. You know, I would mm -hmm. think about it. And for whatever reasons... I blew out my knee and then, you know, that master's program was fresh in my brain and Hunter Hillenmeyer from the Chicago Bears. Yeah, 92. Masters while we played. Yeah. Yep. So I'm like, man, I'm going back to school. So while I was rehabbing, I started my master's program and um, it took me three years to finish the master's program, but I did it. And that's what really started me and kicked me off in entrepreneurship because at the time I was like 33. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Most players are done. You play from 22 to 25 and you're done. Yeah. For me, it's like I just came off of I was just starting. I was playing my best ball to blowing out my knee. And so I'm like, okay, how much time do I have left? And I ended up having three years left. I ended up doing my master's in three years, ended up winning a Super Bowl that year. So <laughs> everything kind of just ended all at the right time. And I think what my master's taught me is I kind of have this thing, it's the three or the four Ps, it just depends on you know how many apply to you. Is that what are you passionate about? And I learned like all right, what, what, what's Brendan passionate about? I'm passionate about fitness. I love fitness. Why do I love fitness? Like, I love looking good. I love feeling good. But I love changing people's lives through fitness. It's much easier for me to, to work you out three times a week to ultimately get you to reach all your goals outside of the gym than it would be for me to work with you on a financial level, educational level. You know what I'm saying? I yep. think fitness is a springboard to help people get better and everything else. Is there a problem in fitness? Yeah, Americans are super duper unhealthy. That's why we're all dying from COVID because we're mor morbidly obese, right? So, so solving that problem, I found purpose. So it goes passion, problem, purpose. Those are the three P's for me. Um, it, I have purpose in making people feel better. Like I wake up every day, just like I want a Super Bowl. When I see, oh, Matt just hit his goal on what he wants to bench press or what he wants his body fat to be like, or Cynthia is now off of her um, diabetes medication. 
I'm just throwing names out there, for yeah, example. Yeah. That gives me purpose. I wake up just like I'm ready to go play against Tom Brady. You know? <laughs> um, and then um, through that, through solving a problem, through having passion and, and having purpose, then the fourth P is profit. I'm able to make money off of this. And so that's ultimately what I did. And I made more money in fitness my first five years in fitness than I made my entire life in football. Times what? Three. I went three X what my entire football career was in five years. And I started playing football when I was 14. Wow. I played all the way till I was 36. And from, from 37 to 42, I made more money in fitness than I made my whole life in football. So wow. um, that's what really um, inspired <clears throat> me was finding my purpose, finding my passion, being able to solve problems and then turning that into a profit. Bro, it's a sick workout, man. I mean, Orange Theory is a sick workout. I mean, I love that, uh, the tracker, the heart monitor. And it's based on your age. So I'm here I am in the 40s. I'm wondering, the heck, why, why is my stuff in the orange and I'm breathing heavy? I guess it's targeted to your, to your age, whatever. But, bro, I'm finding right. myself competing with the soccer moms and they're up in it and I'm up in it. And I'm like, what are you trying to compete with me? I'm, I'm up in it. And everybody sees their, uh, their heart uh, rate at the top and I'm in the red zone. I said, I'd be in the red zone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't sleep on the ladies. The ladies be crushing us when it comes to that hit training, man. I'm telling you. And they're, they're, the ladies' uh, pain tolerance is so high up there, man. I'm like, wow, I'm getting, I'm getting smoked. I need, to get better. <laughs> I need to get better, man. You know what it is, though? Like, the, the ladies, they weigh, you know, 100 to 150. The guys weigh, like, 160 to 250. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just got a lot more. We're tugging around. But, um, hey, yeah. When it could, yeah, just the energy in there and – and, and that's why, like, when I walked into my first Orange Theory, it was three days after I won the Super Bowl. I know the day. It's February 6th, right? Won the Super Bowl on February 3rd, 2013. My first Orange Theory class was February 6th, 2013. It blew my mind when I went in there, and I felt the energy. I started doing the workout. I saw people were in there. Like, I got I got paid to work out, basically, right? Um, they're in there. They're, what's their payment is playing with their kids, getting off medication, reaching new fitness goals, the community. So, once I saw that, I'm like, man, I need to bring this to California. And, and like yeah. I told you, I'm the luckiest guy I know. It just so happened that um, the studio I went into, the headquarters were upstairs. Wow, right there. So I became a member that day, and then I started doing some research. And remember, I was you know finishing up my master's degree, and I'm like, I need to just make a phone call and go right upstairs. I used, you know, I leveraged it. Hey, I'm a Super Bowl champion. I'm an LGBTQ rights champion. They welcomed me with open arms, and I went up in there, and it's – we never looked back. And then I broke all the records for what they thought a studio could achieve in terms of revenue and workouts in a month or a year. And we, you know, me and my team, we broke all the records just because this passion, it bleeds over. And then for me to see my members going out there and achieving all their financial goals and relationship goals and health goals, I knew this was a place that I needed to be for a long time. And so, you know, we have, we're 50 studios in, we're, we're going to build another 50 studios and we're going to do some, we're going to continue to do some magic as soon as all this blows over. Yeah, exactly, man. I, I think it's starting to open back up there in uh, your great state of California, led there by Governor uh, Newsom. Man, we're still shut down. But, okay. you know, the thing is, is that I don't, I don't, you know, as much as I want to be open, I don't, I, I don't feel, you know, I, I straddle both lines. Like, I don't necessarily like, oh, you're in Texas and things are open. That's fine. I'm in California. Things are closed. That's fine. Like, our business is losing a ton of money. But if we're saving lives and, no, you know, I, I mean, I know in fitness, like, you could come to our studio. We could keep you safe. And we're going to get you healthier and make you stronger if and when you do get COVID. I understand that. But um, it's just, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do things right now. I don't mind being ultra safe like we're being. I know that some businesses are being shut down and it's tough on some people. I know other families are losing family members. You know, so I'm sensitive to both sides. And when the timing is right and we're allowed to do what we're able to do, then we'll open things up. But I see Texas. I see Florida. Like people are out doing their thing, working out and business is fine. We just started open up here. We just went to tier one, 50% capacity. We can open up here in Illinois. So uh, we were just there at the gym this morning. And I asked them if the group class is open again. So they're starting to do that a little bit. Um, That's why you're looking all chiseled, dog. That's why you're looking all good over there on the other side of the camera. <laughs> my, 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 my trainer's on me, man. And, uh, you know, I, um, I, I bought into wanting to recreate myself every every bit you know I, my military injuries you know l4 l5 you know what's called it stenosis my patella tendons were jacked i should have got it operated a long time ago and they they uh, what do you call it calcified scar tissue over i'm just starting to break loose of that right now man and uh, you know and uh we're getting ready to go to hawaii here in about five weeks man so we're going to maui and uh you know we're gonna have some fun fun in the sun take the family out uh, hang out with again. <laughs> i just went i just went it was fire yeah which island yeah, which island go to perfect. We went to Maui. 
No, nice, nice. Very yeah, cool. Did you guys go to the crater? You guys go out to the crater, the Molokani crater out there in the in, in the ocean? We went to, no, we didn't do that. I wish we would have, but we did some of the, the, the hikes and we did snorkeling and paddle boarding and um, everything for the most part was open with um, limited capacity. So yeah. there was some um, reservation constraints because yeah. everything was limited, yep. but it felt like um, it was perfect. Like there was enough people where you didn't feel like you were alone, but there wasn't too many people where it felt like it was crowded. And I just love that they were still supporting the locals and allowing tourism. Yeah you know, to feed the island and feed the, uh, feed the state, um, yeah. which, which is tough. They said that they've never seen it, you know, so empty there around the holidays and whatnot. So, yeah. you know, once again, you know, we all got to do our part to keep people safe, but to keep businesses open as much as we can as well. You know, let, let's, let's talk about, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about your advocacy, you know, um, you know, 2009, you became advocating for legalization of same sex marriage. And, um, although you're not gay, although you're not, uh, uh, um, you're happily married with your wife, but you were standing up for an injustice that you, that you felt was uh, uh, reminding you of the Loving versus uh, Virginia type, type situation, where if you were in Virginia, if you were in that state, you couldn't get married to your wife. So, so why why advocate for same sex marriage, Brandon? What 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 inspired you to do that? Yeah, you know, it's like I do it for people like you. I do it for people like me. I do it for our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. I do it for transgender people. I do it. Um, the thing is that what, what people fail to see is that if you see injustice from someone because of their religion, um, because of their ethnicity, their gender, if you see injustice and you don't stand up for it, then it's just a matter of time before those same people pick on you and they find something that's different with you where you don't fit in with their crowd. So it's like injustice somewhere is injustice everywhere when it yeah. comes to America. So I just, I didn't buy into that whole thing. And, you know, luckily my parents raised me in such a way that I understood that loving first Virginia wouldn't allow a black man or a, or a white man to marry a black woman or a white woman in Virginia at that point in time. So I didn't see it any differently that, um, same sex marriage, the government was telling us who we could yeah. and cannot love. And it's the same thing with gender. So I just, I've been, I've been blessed that my parents taught me that like, you know, g gender isn't just male and female and that sexuality isn't just gay or straight or it isn't just straight, you know? Uh -huh. There's a there's a whole prism of what sexuality is, whatever whatever whichever if it's, you know, you're bisexual, you're um you're homosexual or you're heterosexual, like and you don't make those choices to be those things. That's just the way that you're wired. And same with gender. It's like there's just not male and female. There's all kinds of prisms, you know, that, that there's and it's fine to to be anywhere on that prism. Um, and if you look at the animal kingdom, there's the same thing. There's all kinds of different animals that are different types of genders and have different sexual orientations as well. And so I was just, I was raised that way. And a lot of it comes, you know, from based off of ethnicity and being able to choose who we fall in love with. And people aren't taught that really in school. And so I kind of led the way in terms of professional athletes and doing that. And my boy, um, Scott Vegeta was on that kick and, and a bunch of other guys that I played with, you know, supported it. But um, it was it was a tough road, you know. A lot of people yeah. were calling me out, you know, for yeah. statements that I made. <laughs> right, and uh, uh, I think you were on some uh, headline of uh, NFL players finally turning, uh, finally coming out and sharing their, you know, show, you know, sh showing that they're gay. And you're like the the pick, the the, the poster board for that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, oh, hold, hold on. <laughs> It was so humbling, though, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, it says, Brendan Ambedee just coming out, you know? And, like, for me, like, my, my instinct is like, oh, wait, no, no, I'm not coming out. Like, it, it even brought up insecurities that I have, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, like, who cares? Like, yeah, yeah. Day, like, now, you know, at 45, and I think about, you know, I started doing this, you know, 10-plus years ago, um, 10, 15 years ago, like, I, now I, I don't even care what they say. I got, you know, I'm married, I got three kids, like, you know, it, it is what it is. But before, like, I was kind of sensitive to it. You yeah. know, like, oh, Brendan's gay, this or that. Oh, Brendan, you know, he likes to dress a certain way or his eyebrows look like this or <laughs> he shades or like, man, I don't... Like, remember I told you, like, things that don't serve you, just throw the things that don't serve you, just throw those all away. Like, insecurities, worrying about what people say. Like, now it's like... Yeah. Man, I'm a I'm a damn I'm a Hummer just going down the street like nothing even bothers me now. It just all bounces off. That's it, man. And and um, you know, for for a lot of people right now, the pandemic has has caused them to see a lot of things um, and being shoved into their uncomfort zone. You know, people watching this right now, what what type of steps would you share with them and how to recreate yourself and how to 
So you know what? I didn't think I was going to be doing this. I thought I was going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Now I'm doing this. I'm not sure if this is the move I make. Do I step out in fear? Do I step out in faith? Do I go back to wait, wait for a COVID check? How would, you, how would you encourage America to start recreating themselves? Man, in any crisis, there's so much opportunity. And it, there's so, so much of a test of character. It's like, why are you as, as, as successful as you are? Like, why are you trying to reinvent yourself? Like, you look better than all the guys your age. You're, you're very successful. You're, you know, you're married, wife, kids. Like, why are you? You're already amazing. You're already in the 99th percentile. Why do you need to sharpen anything that you're doing? Why don't you just stay the same? Um, and, you know, I, I look at it the same for me. And, and that's just the character that I have. Like, and the same as you, like, I'm always trying to get better. So, man, this pandemic, and don't take this the wrong way, but it was one of the best things that happened to me. Um, I understand there's a lot of loss, and, um, and, and I sympathize with all the, the, the struggles and, and whatnot that people are going through. Like, my business got completely shut down. I had a three-month-old baby at home, and I got to spend more time with my family than I've ever spent with my family before. I learned so much about my family and the character of my family. As much as we argue and yell in this house, like, yep. we love to be together, you know? And then it forced me to really manage my portfolio, which is something, you know, I, I, I left it in other hands before. And then the world's changing right now. You mm -hmm. look at what's going on with equality and equal rights. Like companies need to hire qualified women and people of color. They need to, you know, give them equitable positions, make them executives in companies. Um, finances are changing. We're going to cryptocurrency. You know that the, the fiat money or paper money is it's not as valuable as it used to be. So what's your store of value? Um, energy is changing. We're going away from fossil fuels and we're using the sun and we're using electricity. electricity. And so there's so many opportunities in which the world is changing. These things all would have happened maybe in 2030, but COVID made them happen in 2010 yeah. and 2020. So COVID made them happen right now. So how are you going to evolve in one year? How are you going to evolve 10 years like the industry is evolving in one year? If you can do that, then you're going to be set to make this run that all these companies are going to be making that are just taking off right now, whether it comes to medicine and telemedicine, you see Zoom blowing up, at-home workouts blowing up, all these companies evolved and they made it through. And then you see a bunch of companies that are like the oil industries thrashed, uh, traditional ice, um, internal combustion engine, traditional co car companies are thrashed, um, airlines thrashed. Um, you look at... Um, Cruises are, you know, the, the movie business is all messed up, right? So what are you going to do? Like these companies are out. If you stay in that same type of thinking the, of those old companies, like you're going to go out with them. So how do you evolve and how do you make that transition? Now, I think you and I are lucky because we're kind of in that generation where it's like we, we're old school, but we can adapt. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you're third, if you're in your thirties, like you're new school, if you're 20, you're super new school. Yeah. If you're 50, you're like, ah. I think I'm going to stay investing in Ford. I'm going to stay investing <laughs> in GM. Like I'm not going to um, invest in Tesla or Neo or Lucid or all these amazing, you know, electric car companies that are going to come out and take over the world. So um, I think it's just a, a huge opportunity. And like, you know, you can collect unemployment. Hopefully, you can sit at home. You can take any. You can take courses. You can. Um, research all your information on, on YouTube, or there's a million ways that you can get better. Education is better now than ever, at least in, in giving that information online. And so like, man, I did some certifications online to, to help, you know, so I'm a better, you know, trainer for my clients. Mm -hmm. I did some financial stuff online. And then I just dug really into the stock market and I shifted my whole portfolio. I shifted my life insurance um, strategy, my investing portfolio, and man, I did a, I did a whole evolution. Like I'm ready for the next 50 years after this one year, man. I'm telling you. Man, that's exciting, man. That's exciting. By the way, for those of you just listening to Brandon, he just went off. He just went off to hear the last few minutes. You can tell he's been on these type of things and studying in it and unpacking and popping open hood. Um, Brandon, some people are watching this right now and they're saying, well, it's good for Brandon to do it because he was the NFL player. He made it to the league. He played for 10 years. He made some coin. He made his millions. Dude, I'm just trying to scratch for this COVID check. I'm just trying to scratch with his unemployment check. How do you encourage people to do the most with the least? Man, like I came from nothing. Like I know what it's like to sit in line with food stamps and to sit in line and get government cheese and powdered milk. So, I mean, I think if, if I could do it, you know, and I'm moderately intelligent, but I'm a dog, like I'm a hustler. Like I know what work is, I'm not scared. You know, like we started off this interview, like why were you successful? Like I'm not scared of hard work. 
And no matter what, it's going to take hard work. Like no one's going to give you nothing for free, especially in America with the capitalist society that we have. There's going to be people that are willing. There's people that like my family, my dad came from Nigeria. Your parents, I believe, from the Philippines. Right, right, exactly. They're willing to come over here and work and do their grind, right? Yeah. There's people that are coming from other countries that are willing to work. They're not going to beg or ask for nothing. I've never seen a Mexican beg for nothing. Never seen a Mexican beg ever. I've seen black people beg. I've seen white people beg. Never seen a Mexican ask for nothing. Why? Because Mexicans work. And they'll put 10 people up in the house, six people up in the car, and they're going to take care of each other. They're going to work and grind, and they're going to get to where they need to go. So I think that's the most important thing is, like, don't expect no freebies. Don't expect no handouts. Like, you're going to have to go, and you're going to have to work, and you're going to have to hustle. And if I could do it um, from my background and you could do it from your background, then anybody can do it. But then also, like, there's an intelligence factor. And, And there's two things that separate all people, and money is not one of them. It's how intelligent are you? And how healthy are you? Those are the two most important things that determine success. It has nothing to do with money. You see kids that it, or people that inherit money and they commit suicide later or they win the lotto and they're gone the next year because they didn't know how to handle the money. So your intelligence and your health is actually your wealth. It's not how much is in your bank account. It's not what kind of car you drive or what you're wearing or what type of jewelry you have. It's health and wealth. So if you have, I'm sorry, it's um, intelligence and it's health. So if you have, if you have your health, and you're willing to want to learn and, and um, invest in yourself and in the vessel that you are, then those are the people I want around me that you know, hustle and heart. So, so Brandon, you know, you, you, you're running a business. You got a family. When do you find time to work out, man? When do you find a time to, to eat the right foods? Talk to us, man. Uh, help us, those that are busy. How do we make time? How do you make time? Man, I, I, it's like anything. You got to, you know, time management. You know what I'm saying? Just time management. Um, I eat probably two meals a day. I know I'm going to eat my first meal around 11 o'clock. Um, I might have a little snack in the middle of the day, and then I eat my last meal around 7 o'clock at night, and then I fast intermittently from there. Um, my wife knows she has the foods and the things that we need in the house um, to be healthy, but my damn kids eat all day, every day. <laughs> so, like, if my wife brings home, like, a boba, I love boba. Oh, yeah, of course. Boba, boba, milk tea. Of course. My wife brings home a boba for the kids. I'm like, you got to bring a boba for me. <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the, the hardest part for COVID is that I used to be up and on my feet eight hours a day and out of the house. Now, like, I'm doing Zooms, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing Zoom calls. I'm sitting down. So I have my watch, uh, my Apple watch that tracks how many hours I'm standing during the day. What, what What's my caloric output during the day? So... It's great if you have a, a device that tells you some of these metrics and all these numbers. The only thing I don't count is I count everything in life. I don't count how many calories I eat. I just know I want to eat smaller portions, but I don't count the calories I eat. I count, I, I count you know, how many calories I expend, how long I'm standing, checks I'm writing, money that's coming in, how many feet this damn living room is. Like I yeah. count everything. Numbers are, are, are huge to me. So if you don't track it, you can't train it. If you don't track it, you can't improve on it. So I try to track as many things that I can. And then with foods, it's like, just try to eat naturally. So yeah. get rid of the artificial flavors, colors, preservatives, uh, partially hydrogenated oils, um, and, and try to eat as naturally as possible. Not necessarily organic, because organic is expensive, but try to eat you know as naturally as possible. So that's what I do. Um, Cool. I did gain a COVID-15, though, but I had to figure it out. I had to adjust. I got it off me. My, my six-pack's not as nice as I want it to be, but I'm going to get it back. Um, but, yeah, if you can't track it, you can't change it. So you just got to keep track of, you know, how's your sleep? How's your health? Yeah. When are you eating? What are you eating? And you have to dial those things in. I see you do meal prep. Yeah. You had the chef <laughs> over there. You did meal prep. You had all the calories all accounted for. So that was a beautiful thing. And that helps a ton if you already have a meal that's ready to go. Mm-hmm. You know, it's healthy. You know, the amount of calories that's in it. And so that, that was pretty awesome when I saw you doing that. I do, um, in, in the past, like when I'm starting to train quite vigorously, I got to take in more calories. And um, I do some meal prep as well through certain companies. But um, yeah, yeah, that's a huge benefit if you can do that. Final thoughts here. Um, we have a new president. How do you feel right now with this new administration taking over compared to where we were before? How is it for you in your experience as a black man? How is it going to be, you think, your experience as an entrepreneur? How is it experience for you with, with, with biracial children? How is it going to feel with your advocacy with same sex? What, what's, what are you forecasting here in the next foreseeable future in the life of Brandon Bedale in the, the United States of America? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, the thing for me is that things are usually getting better for us, right? Like, when was Colin Kaepernick Kaepernick kneeling? He was kneeling from what happened during the Obama administration. 
You know what I'm saying? Yep. Chicago's always been deadly for black people. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So gradually things are getting better. I think, thank God, we're finally starting to acknowledge some of the things that were happening in the past and they're still happening today. Nothing's going to change overnight because it's Biden or because it's Trump or because it's Obama. Like we have to consciously make a decision to change things. Boom. And for me, it's like, I want America to be the best America can be. Like our families came here for a reason. And just because you voted for Trump or just because you voted for Biden, like, I want to be able to get along with everybody. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, we all have the same goals. Maybe it's a little bit different way of getting there. And certain things are more important to me, like equality is more important to me, whereas some people it's like, oh, fiscal policy is more important to me. So I can put some of these other things on the back burner. But at the end of the day, they want their kids to have opportunity. I want my kids to have opportunity. I want my kids to have access to education healthcare, and I want them to be safe um, if a peace officer pulls them over or if they're walking through a neighborhood. I think everybody wants those things. So I think just the only difference is that is that this administration acknowledges that there was some inequalities and some unfairness, whereas the other administration is like, oh, we're great. Like, we're going to be greater than we already were. But, you know, these things have always been happening um, and they've been swept under the rug, whether it was Obama's administration, they were all swept under the rug. There was no Black Lives Matters during Obama's administration and um, Eric Garner was killed under his watch. I mean, it's not Obama's fault. Um, and and all, a lot of tra travesties and tragedies happen under every president, but now we're seeing them, we acknowledge them, we know that they're actually happening and, and how do we go, out, go about making a difference? And um, the thing that I love about Biden is I love that his cabinet has gay people, it has women, it has uh, black people in positions that they've never been before, mm -hmm. Native Americans um, mm -hmm. in, in positions that they've never been before, and Latinos and Asians and whatnot. So Pacific Islanders, I hope, too. Yeah. Oh, but, but, um, potent so potentially the first... We acknowledge it. Yeah. We want to we wanna give people that um, are, are credible and people that are deserving and earned it positions that normally were reserved for only white folks. So... I think that's a cool thing. And of course, there's going to be there's turmoil. We saw what happened on January 6th, which was a huge, a huge black eye on our democracy. Like we can't let stuff like that happen. Um, but at the end of the day, like I want to bury the hatchet. I want to be able to go back to not having any friction of cool. You voted for Trump. Like, let's bury the hatchet. Like, what do we do to make America better? Like, I don't want people to be all butthurt because Biden's in and yeah. they're doing this or they're doing that. Like at some point, we have to come together as a people. We have to unify United States of America and America is built on the backs of your people built on the backs of my people. And you know, let's go forward and make this country live up to its name of the, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Do you, do you think America is getting away from capitalism more into socialism? Because if, if fiscal policies are very important to you, how do you feel about, you know, our taxes increasing? How do you feel about, you know, more money didn't dig out of the taxpayers to fund social things? I mean, is it equal opportunity or is it equal distribution i mean what, what, are, you, what are you thinking about our economic yeah, I mean, system i think you, if you if you look at some of the other great countries around the world and you look at where people are the happiest they're paying some of the highest taxes you know countries that have um universal health care free education um their quality of life and the crimes and the violence is a lot less now of course we're a bigger country um we have a lot more people and a, a lot of diversity in this country so I think there's a healthy balance, you know, like, yeah, um, if, if Biden eliminates your, um, your, one of the taxes, it's your, uh, damn, what's it for your, your capital gains tax. So okay. if my capital gains tax goes into the same tax bracket that I'm taxed my normal, you your, know, my normal your earning income tax. tax. Yeah. 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 I, I won't be happy about that. You know, yep. at the end of the day, I won't be happy about that for me. Then I have to figure out a way strategically to be able to straddle that fence and have my tax attorney come up with a way of, of what, what are we going to do with our capital gains and how are we going to avoid being taxed at the higher. So, you know, it's cops and robbers. You got to figure it out. Everyone doesn't have access to that, but man, I'm in California. We're taxed a ton already. Yeah, I pay a ton in taxes as it is, but I also grew up on welfare. I also grew up on section eight and that's that tax money goes to help um, people like that, you know, so in a uh, Medicaid or Medicare, whatever it's called that I grew up on as well. So, but I think there's a healthy balance. You, you want to live in America and have the opportunities that we have and make the money that you could potentially make in America. You got to pay to pay, you got to pay to play to live here. But yeah, I don't want to go the socialist route and increase taxes ex exponentially where the bulk of my, then I better get healthcare. I better get free education. Like there better be a whole bunch of perks that come with that. It can't stay the same if you tax us more.
Man, I, you know, Brandon, I appreciate your time, man. Um, before I sign off, where can more people find information about you? By the way, if you guys are looking for a corporate speaker, you guys are looking for a model, <laughs> you guys are looking for, for someone to train you, make sure you reach out to Brandon. Brandon, where can more people find information about you? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way is you can uh, have a blue check by my name, whether you find me on Facebook, which I actually engage a lot on Facebook, which I've been enjoying. Um, and then my Instagram account as well, um, at Brendan310. At Facebook, you just type in Brendan I am Badejo. And then uh, Brendan, B R E N D O N 310 um, on uh, Instagram. Awesome. By the way, before I let you go, my team want to make sure we give you a little special gift, okay? So on behalf of the Seven Figure Squad team, uh, we mentioned it earlier. We got we have a merch kit for you, but uh, one of the first ones we want to give you is an Entrepathy shirt from us to you, man, because you are an entrepreneur, athlete, and combined together, you're a stud. So uh, this has come from our office to your address, and uh, on behalf of Seven Fair Squad and our community and our audience, hey, man, we thank you for spending a little bit of time with us and sharing your knowledge uh, about life in in professional sports. What it's been like for you as a as a, as a biracial. A child in America and raising biracial children, standing up for the LGBT community, standing up for injustice, and now rocking the business world. So impre- super impressed and extremely proud of you, big dog. Thanks, man. You better send me that XL, dog. Come on, baby. <laughs> you know it, man. With that being said, guys, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notification next time. We upload our next episode. You are alerted. So that being said, guys, drop your thoughts, drop your comments, drop your feedback, drop your follows. Make sure you follow Brendan here on Instagram too as well. That being said, on behalf of Brendan, I'll be Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye, guys. 